What's wrong, Vince? I'm looking to update my deck and nothing recently printed in white excites me anymore. And I'm just feeling like maybe it's trailing behind in the color pie. Wait, didn't we just get Smothering Tithe last year? I'm trying to rebuild Legacy Death and Taxes, Brian. I stand by my comment. It's days like today when I feel so disenfranchised that I kind of wish that white never existed. Never existed? Be careful what you wish for, Vince. Ari Nia of Wizards R&D, what are you doing in my office? I'm the white mana guru. Whenever someone loses faith in white, I magically appear. That must keep you pretty busy. Silence! Oh my goodness, you, you XL Brian. Yep, gonna get a lot of high fives back at the mothership for that. Now, Vince, you get your wish. White never existed. Tell me, Vince, how are you going to answer any non-land permanent for just three mana without white? Beast within, silly. Oh. Okay, but what, what if you want a 4-4 creature that has both flying and vigilance? I thought that was a black-green creature. <sighs> I guess so. Wait, is this how your visits normally go? No. Look, look at what you're playing in modern if there's no white. Oh no. Oh no, this... This is Mono Blue Tron. <laughs> White, come back. Please. Please. White, come back. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dies to Removal. I, as always, am the professor. My co-host, the ever-so-pleasant Vincent of Kenobi, is here with us once again. And we have a very special guest, Ari Nia of Wizards of the Coast R&D, literally someone who designs the very cards we play with. But not only that, is the white representative on the Council of Colors. So not only are we talking R&D matters today, but since we've got Ari, we're going to be talking about white. Ari, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start just by talking about what it is you do in R&D, because a lot of people think of R&D as a blanket term. It could mean a lot of things. What is your job? What do you, you make the cards we play with, right? Uh, yes, broadly speaking. So I work mostly in vision design and exploratory design, which are sort of the two earliest phases of, of magic design. It's not at this, you know, towards the end we have play design where they're balancing all the cards for competitive play. And you have, you know, those people have a very different skill set from me. Those people like are like ex-pro players who are, who are extremely skilled at, at these sort of subtle, subtle balance issues. And then earlier than that, we have set design where they're really building all of the cards. They're like making all the decisions, swapping this card in and that card out changing the cost on this, changing the mechanic on that. But even before that, exploratory and vision design, we're figuring out what are the big themes of the set? Hmm. What are the structures of the set? What are our main set mechanics? That's my job. Cool. That's so you uh, you actually like might say, hey, what if this mechanic were our returning mechanic? Perhaps yes. that might be something you'd contribute. Absolutely. That's one example of something I'd contribute. Another thing I do is come up with new mechanics, right? So if I had been on the on the team for, say, uh, Guilds of Ravnica, which I wasn't, that was before my time, then presumably I would have generated, you know, maybe five different Boros mechanics, keywords, before we settled on Mentor. Mm -hmm. And I would have come up with them, made designed some cards in them, made little playtest decks to try them out in action and be like, all right, is this a fun thing for the Boros to be doing in this set? You mentioned that Allegiance was before your time, Ravnica right Allegiance. Is, yes. Just so people at home know, when was the first set that you had your, your, we could say had your touch on it? A few of my cards were in Throne of Eldraine in, in the Brawl decks, but the first set that I was on a vision design team for was Equestrian. Which is far not in out the future. Yet. Yes, right. it's not that far away. It's coming, coming up pretty quickly. So is that it this year? No, that would be one year from today? Yes. Yes, I yeah. After, after Zendikar Rising? Yes. Okay, right. cool, cool, cool. All right. But you, you made a few cards like, uh, uh, do you know, remember some of the cards that you had a hand in? Yes. Um, Tome of Legends and Mace of the Valiant and uh, what, Vanish into Fable, I think it's called. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay. the, 
the the bounce spell. So keep keep in mind for our audience that R and D does not work with the cards with the names that we experience. So when uh, someone from R and D yeah. is thinking, "Oh, what was the card called?" and you might say, "Well, didn't you work on it?" It had a completely different name in, yeah. in design. Yeah, I'm awful with card names. Like basically. Like, while I'm at the office, I'm nonstop looking up cards to know what they're called because I know what many of them do, but almost what none of them are called. Right. And do your babies come out the other side looking very different? So concept at a conceptual level, because you said you're quite early in the design process, by the time they get to the into the player's hands, are they... Uh, like several mana more, different colors, different themes? Uh, y you know, it, it depends on the card, but often that is the case. Um, so if I'm if I'm on vision design and I'm like designing a bunch of cards for a mechanic and I'm like, okay, we're going to have this mechanic in red, so we'll probably put it on a burn spell. Like probably that card, we'll see it, it, see it uh, print like in some form, but the mana cost might be different. How much damage it does might be different. Right. Maybe they'll decide it needs to exile when the creature dies just because of how it needs to be positioned in the metagame. Like right, okay. all of that might change. Whereas other other cards, like if I'm just making a top-down design or like I'm trying to design a planeswalker or something like that, like probably a million things will change. Right. Okay. Or it'll just get cut. Um, so you said you are, well, I say you said, Brian introduced you as the a representative for the color white on the Council of Colors. Yes. So what exactly does that entail? What what, what do you do in that yeah. role? Yeah. So the Council of Colors is a sort of an, an advisory council within R&D that helps ensure that the color pie is as it exists and it, it is continuously evolving, but that it is adhered to by all of the different design teams. Because, you know, there's so many people on many different teams designing lots of cards for lots of products. And, you know, we don't have time for each of them to be an expert in exactly what each of the five colors can do. Mm -hmm. So what happens is during set design, um, at various points through through set design, we will look at the file. We'll look at the card file, and each of us will look at the cards in our color plus multicolor cards and mm -hmm. things like that. So I'll look at all the white cards, and I'll be like, okay, can white do this? Is this appropriate? And also, you know, so there's some question of like, is this is this in color pie at all? And also, there's like relative color pie things where like, you know, we want we want some colors to be stronger at some things than others. Right, okay, okay. And is that, and that, so this is very much from a mechanical perspective in terms of what the colors can do, more so than like theme or flavor. It, yes, I would say almost exclusively mechanics. Right, okay. Although, of course, mechanics are connected to flavor. So if, if, for example, if there's some mechanic that is entirely new to magic, right? Maybe it's a set theme or maybe it's just a weird new car that like, we don't know what, what that color that mm -hmm. is. There's no precedent then we might rely on flavor to partly justify it. Sure. Because, w you know, whether or not it's going to feel like it belongs in the color makes a big difference mm -hmm. um, for the from the player's perspective. If they're like, this card just doesn't feel red. Like, a good example of this is um, if, if we had a... If we had a green card that was a combination of a bite, that is, a creature deals damage to... To target, yeah, a, yeah, right? a one side of fight, as some people call it, that sort of thing. Right, so is that bite? Uh, yeah, bite. Fight? yeah okay. Right, so so if we have a creature that's ETB, or, or actually it doesn't need to be bite, it could be fight, but it's ETB fight and it has death touch, mm -hmm. right? That's a mono greed card, and oh, and it has flash too, right? Right, okay. <laughs> Right? Sounds like a green card. Yeah, sounds like a green <laughs> card, right? But it doesn't really feel like a green card. It's like, come on, this is just Doom Blade. Who are you kidding, right? So like, yeah, okay. So, okay. so you know, we we do have to be thoughtful about those things. There's right. a lot of subtlety in what we do, and we spend a lot of time discussing individual cards and be like, is this is this too close to the line? Sure. Um, in particular, though, I want to say one thing about what the Council of Colors is and isn't. We're not the ones who determine how strong the cards are. Sure. Right. Okay. So, like a lot of a lot of people say, "Wow, the whoever the the green person on the Council of Colors is, they must like bully the rest of the council sure. because green's really strong in standard right now. They must have made all those cards really strong." Well, that's that's nothing close to what we do. Okay. Okay. Um, and so we're already getting on to talk about some of the elephants in the room and the let's, jokes let's, about that. Sort of I, stuff. Let, let's be honest. <laughs> has has the green representative has has this person been perhaps? A little, a little mean to you lately? No, Have they been he is, domineering. He is extremely kind okay. and right. very good no, at kickboxing as well, <laughs> but also extremely kind. So, so what what a card does and how powerful it is, those are 
not entirely independent variables, but they kind of are, right? Yeah. In that, like, how much mana something costs and what l literal numbers you put on it affects that. Yeah. And I guess that very nicely segues us into, like, the elephant in the room, which is mm -hmm. the running joke that white isn't good enough or is underpowered or, or and all that sort of stuff. So how, without making it sound too much like putting you on the spot, but how do you respond to those accusations or that... Accusations is a very strong word. <laughs> <laughs> how do you... How would you respond to that idea that yeah. white is a bit weak? In the How do you respond to the meme that I, I mean? Yeah. I think it's fair to just say like like there's also just a joke to it, which I'm a big fan of of humor on the internet. I like making Magic the Gathering jokes and memes, and white has been a little bit of that lately about it being the weakest of the five colors or the color that gets the least things. And so you are the white representative. Uh, how do you respond to that? I like how do you respond to that? How do you yeah. respond? How do you respond to the accusations, Ari? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know. So last weekend I was watching Worlds um, and the the finals were between two white decks, Jeskai Fires and Azorius Control, and the and the blue-white deck won using a lot of really awesome white cards, right? Like the Archon of Sun's Grace and Elspeth Conquers Death and Shatter the Sky, some very powerful white cards we've printed recently. So I think in standard, white is in a pretty okay place. Um, and if you look at... Pioneer. There's some there's some good white decks in there as well. There's a uh, there's Bant Spirits. Yep. There's um Heliod, the Heliod Hel deck. Yeah, the Hel Heliod deck with um with uh Devotion and Walking Ballista and yeah. things like Walking that. Walking one of the best honorable white cards in recent memory. It's not bad. <laughs> um, but you know, Arcanist's Owl to get you your Heliod and mm -hmm. Walking Ballista, mm -hmm. a very strong white card. Um and in Limited, actually, I think white has been pretty good the last few sets. If you look at Throne of Eldraine in Limited, the color balance was very good. Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, if you look at Throne of Eldraine standard for a while, we weren't seeing a lot of white decks played at the highest levels. Sure. And that was around the time everyone started memeing white super, super hard. But if you look historically, if you look back further than that, right, um, just the previous year, there were lots of white decks being yeah, played definitely. in Standard, right? There was Esper Hero. There yeah. was Mono White, Mono White Splashing Red yeah, often. Yeah. There was Mono the Portal. Celestia Tokens deck. Mm -hmm. There was Esper Control with Kaya's Wrath, super strong card. So I I think that um, I think there was some recency bias when sure. Throne of Eldraine uh, Standard was going on and people were like, oh, White's always been the weakest color. If you look back 10 years or so of standard, then white has historically be, been one of the strongest colors in standard play. Okay, so I, I wouldn't disagree with anything you said. Like, I've got no counterpoint to that. I think that's all pretty valid too. I guess, and this is something that I witnessed in my own comment section, which people uh, very much getting on this horse that white is bad, yeah. which isn't necessarily the f phrase that I would use. The thing that I would ask you about is, do we think that perhaps white is a little narrow in what it does compared to other colors? Well... Here's where I think the the real source of all the memes is is Commander. Mm -hmm. Okay. That it's Commander is our most popular casual format by a, by a, a pretty big big amount. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at monocolor decks in Commander, it absolutely is true that white lags behind the other four col colors significantly. Okay. And is that because it doesn't get to do a lot of things the other colors can do in some capacity? Do you think? I mean, name, we're getting to it because we're going to talk about yeah. like, drawing cards, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about the specific specific strengths of white. Okay. So sweepers certainly are one of one of the big ones. Um, I mean, and on the topic of things getting stronger, I mean, we have to give credit where credit is due. For the longest time, we weren't going to have four mana wraths. It's something that wizards had said themselves. And then we had Kai's wrath. Now we've had shout of the sky. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're going back to more powerful wrath effects. So again, it kind of. Uh, exemplifies that point that white isn't necessarily weak, like people keep joking that it is, because we're getting four mana wraths again, which are pretty good. Yeah, and I think Realm Cloak's giant. I mean, it's a yeah, it's, it's a five mana strong. wrath, but it, it you know it draws you a seven seven, so it's <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. That, that was my preview card. That was my preview card. So I I have a special place yeah. in my heart for that. So you think it's just Commander then, or not just? You think Commander plays a large role in the perception of? white weakness. I do, because if you look at white's greatest strengths, um, then you you see things like single target removal, mm -hmm. right? Versatile single target removal like Banishing Light, um, or powerful downside removal like Path to Exile, things like that. And one for one removal in Commander, not so good. Like you know, you need to play some of it, but still at the end of the day, you're down a card, 
the person who's permanent you took out is down a card, and the other two players are both pretty happy about it, right? Um, other things like token generation, right? Going wide, cards like Hero of Precinct 6, cards like History of Benalia, those cards are just not going to be good in a format where instead of 20 life, your opponents have a total of 120 life. That's again, that's the thing that I talk about where white right. feels narrow in the sense that it either has good support cards for control, as we can see in current standard and recent standards, or it has this go wide aggressive strategy. And that's yeah. kind of where it sort of then runs out of steam in terms of like uh, places to explore. And also, yeah. back to the card advantage question again, because pinpoint removal is great if you can refuel your hand. But if yes. you're not playing with a support card like green or blue or even black in Commander, refilling your hand is actually quite difficult in colors like white. Yes, it is. And it's interesting you mentioned support colors because as, as a monocolor like deck, white is weaker in Commander. Mm -hmm. If you look at it as a support color, if you're playing white as like the third color in your deck, it's mm -hmm. actually reasonably good, right? Yeah. Because you're getting your card draw from somewhere else and you're getting your really strong removal spells and sure. sweepers. And I mean, white is white. the best sideboard color, like, hands down, right? Like, right. In Legacy the strongest... and Modern, there's all these incredibly strong sideboard cards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think in competitive, in most competitive formats, um, Popper as as well, actually. I forgot to mention Popper. Popper, uh, uh, white? Do. <laughs> yes, indeed, they do. But no, white has a very strong role in Popper from everything from Boros Monarch decks. I, I mean, the newly printed Ephemerate uh, is doing a lot of heavy hitting in Popper, we have cards like Palace Sentinels, which give you the Monarch effect. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So white is strong in Popper, uh, a, a very strong color. So I think I think it, it generally does have the tools to succeed in most formats. Um, one of the challenges that we deal with is that white's particular style of aggro is kind of a is kind of a like go wide aggro and pump your team, and that is uh that that is a, a strategy which is extremely dependent on first of all on play draw right if i'm on the play it's way better than if i'm on the draw mm -hmm. so it's very good and best of one um and also it's sort of balanced on a knife's edge of how good are the sweepers right that if you sure. if you have cry of the carnarium and things like that that's going to affect a lot like how good that deck is. So that, you know, that that gives us some challenges in trying to balance those things. Is it not possible then perhaps to compare it to red in the sense that red also has this uh, focus on aggressive strategies in 1v1. However, red has had a lot of development over the last few years. We had a time when it, red was pa parallel to white in the fact that like, he'd never draw cards. And then over time we've had things from um, like, uh, what's the spectacle card where you exile cards off your library? What's it called? Light up the stage. Light up the stage. Yes. This, this, this space and act on impulse and all these exile cards until next turn. Yeah, experimental effects. frenzy. Yeah, experimental yeah. frenzy is a very good example. So red seems to have had the criticisms that it had addressed and explored in a very uh, fulfilling way that the community and everyone is like, oh, that's cool. That's what red does now. Yeah. Meanwhile, white still doesn't have anything like that because yeah. it its card draw is always so conditional to the point that it's just not worth it in Commander, for example. Yeah, I th I think that's that's a valid criticism. Mm. Um, and you know, as as Magic sort of evolves, one of the things that we think about is what does card draw look like in each color, right? Like, we, the, and there have been a number of ways angles White has attacked this, right? That we've got Enchantress effects. Sure. We've got things like SRAM. You say Enchantress effects, but have they not moved into green more so? Uh, the, they also exist in green. Yeah, but, but I mean, they're, they're more in green now, right? Like well, the, the, the key one in Theros that's seeing play is right. so, it's a green card. So, yes, th that is true. But I I don't think that creates a problem for white. In, in the context of Theros, right, Archon of Sun's Grace, I like to think of Archon of Sun's Grace as having Constellation draw a card. That card happens to be a zero mana 2-2 two, two flying life. Sure. So you're, in terms of getting advantage and pulling ahead, White definitely still has the tools from that, even if the words draw a card or not sure, printed like, um, on the card. We spoke about this a bit before the podcast, but I, I call it virtual card advantage, right? This yeah. is a place that I've been saying for a long time, White should have access. Like Blade Spicer, people watching this might know Blade Spicer is one of my favorite cards of all time. It always draws you a card, that card being a 3-3. Three, three. So do you think like virtual card advantage is the place where White can draw cards more so than literally saying draw a card on a magic card? I think there's I think there's interesting possibilities in all of those spaces, to be honest. I think there's there's a lot to explore about how can you draw cards, how can you literally draw cards off your library and still have that feel distinctly white. Like 
what we found for red was that this impulsive draw where you're exiling a card mm -hmm. but you don't get it forever, that that felt very red because yeah. it was emotional and it was in the moment. What is it that feels white specifically? I can't answer that question right now. But, you know, I, I do know that the answer is not just take divination sure. and make it white instead. You know? Right. Yeah, because the color pie is important, right? Yes. We can't just have it bleed across from, from color the color, because otherwise what's the point of having the color pie in the first place? Right, so why does the color pie even exist? Well, so first of all, it's a partitioning of five into of the sort of the flavor space, right? Of the, like, where do we put each fantasy creature? And also the emotional flavor space. What are, like, all the aspects of human personality and human emotional experience? Let's put those into five categories. And we're also going to hook those up to five categories of mechanical space that seem to correspond well, so that gives people a feeling, yes, this is my identity. I am a white mage. I am a red mage. This is how it feels to play this color. It's also to enforce strategic diversity. Right, mm -hmm. that if we, if every card can, if every color can do everything, then you know it doesn't really matter which color you play. All they all play exactly the same, or you'll only play the strongest color. And there's no reason to play the weaker ones because they all have access to the same cards. But aren't you running a risk? And here's the thing that stands out to me: Aren't you running a risk when you look at, for example, well, there's things that white maybe is not doing as well as the other colors in Commander. You mentioned uh, uh, card draw refilling your hand. And isn't that then in conflict with uh, what you just stated? Because if you're going to move to design ways for white to do what every other color is doing, then aren't you bleeding across the color pie where it's just like, well, white can do it, green can do it, black can do it, blue can do it, red can now do it. Or isn't there concern that, that, that we're losing ultimately color identity? I think that concern absolutely exists, um, but the, the, the way I answer that is that there are some game actions and objects which are so fundamental that every color should be able to do them mm -hmm. in their own way. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example of that. Creature removal. I think creature removal is an essential part of the game, right? Creatures are the basic pieces, and, and I'm mostly a limited player, so mm -hmm. that's probably going to inform some of my stance on this is that I think creatures are the heart of the game. Attacking and blocking is, is what we do. And it, so it makes sense that every color should have some way of dealing with your opponent's creatures, right? And they all do it in different ways that feel distinct to that color, right? That black is going to be casting Doomblade, red is going to be casting Lightning Bolt, right? Blue is going to have some kind of Frozen Solid variant, and white could have Pacifism and green is going to have a fight spell, those are not all the same, but they sure. all do this basic game action that everyone needs to do. And fundamentally, I think drawing cards is also that yeah. kind of basic game action. Because drawing card draw is, uh, along with mana, those are the two things that basically allow you to win games of magic. Like, it, when you really boil it down, even if card advantage means yep. having more creatures than your opponent because you've managed to draw more creatures. One of the things I wanted to ask you about this, when you, we've been talking about this, we haven't come to a natural pause, is that... If white is to draw cards, I'm just playing on the microphone. If white is to draw cards uh, on board, let's say, or not draw cards, to have card advantage on board, which seems like what it does with things like the the new archon that makes Pegasus, but then the other part of its identity is kind of like mass removal. Is white the color in the color pie that struggles against itself as much because it, it its on board uh, presence is its one of its strengths, but its other strength is cleaning up the board. So surely. It's a bit counterintuitive in a way. Uh, yes, I would say that is the case. And that's been baked into white from the very beginning. If you look at Alpha, you know, mm -hmm. that is the set that had Savannah Lions and White Knight and also Balance and Wrath of God. But I think there was, and I mean... And was, Healing Salve. Yeah, so this comes to a yeah. good point because I think there's an inherent imbalance in Alpha anyway. Like we shouldn't... It is baked into the game and it's hard to remove it at this point, but surely when you look at Alpha, you see something like Ancestral Recall, and then you look, is it Visions or Recall? I always get them mixed up. Which is the Ancestral, uh, Ancestral Recall. 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 Visions is the suspend and one. And he Healing Self is the white yeah. version of Ancestral Recall. So you have the Boon Cycle, you have the, all the three mana, the, the one mana make a three thing, right? And Whites is by far and away the worst by an absolutely massive margin, and Blues yeah. is the best because Blue draws three Right, but parts. again, I'm not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about rates. I'm not talking right. about how strong they are. I'm talking about Color Pie, what does white do? And right from the start, Richard Garfield was like, white is going to be both a controlling color and an aggressive color. Mm -hmm. And so far, I think we've oh, we've continued to, to have that be the case. If you look at the history sure. of competitive white decks, 
they mostly come in two varieties. They come uh, uh, with with some exceptions. Yeah. Um, but the, there's going to be an aggressive a Savannah Lions deck, right? Mm -hmm. An aggressive white deck that attacks, that goes wide, that pumps up your creatures and is trying to end the game pretty quickly. Sure. And then there's the Wrath of God deck, which is, you know, sometimes it's blue-white, sometimes it's Jess Guy, sometimes it's Esper, um, sometimes it's Bant, um, that is going to make the game go long, cast Wrath of God, accrue card advantage, and win slowly. Yeah, I guess my question was more about, probably more towards Commander and more towards the monocolored aspect, because... You're, not, you're very rarely playing your Wrath of God in your Savannah Lines deck, right? That's not a thing that you do very often. Well, it can happen, yes. sure. Yeah, sure. that's true. And and the, the the challenge in Commander is that a Savannah Lions deck in and of itself <laughs> is a big challenge. Like playing White Weenie in Commander is like you're 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 on you're in hard mode. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you were playing one on one tokens, for example, yeah. and your card advantage is through token generation. Yeah, and the, the problem is that invest it's not a safe investment. That in Commander, where can you invest resources and know that they're going to be safe? Well, there's two places. First, you can do lands on the battlefield because the social contract means that very few people are going to play a card like Armageddon. Sure. And the other place is cards in hand mm -hmm. because you're probably not going to get mind twisted. Yeah, again, um, another social contract element. Yes. <laughs> Um, but there is no social contract saying that the board is not going to get swept and pe and creatures are, are are all going to stick around forever. In fact, you can pretty reliably expect with four people, yeah, yeah, people the board's going to get wiped reasonably often. Mm. And so investing in virtual card advantage by virtue of like tons and tons of tokens, you can do it. And God Eternal Oketra is actually a very popular mono yeah, commander. Yeah, it's one of the better ones, right? definitely. But like it has to be... It has to be powerful, like Oketra is. So you're you saying, I guess, to an extent, then, that white is inherently at a disadvantage because it's in, right. in Commander, at least. Because Commander was not designed like to to work with the color pie sure. as it was conceived for one v one twenty life magic. It's a fundamentally different animal, um, and so making making white work well in Commander is a, a, a different challenge. Well, sure, but is so. But why isn't it okay that maybe that's just what that's an aspect to white. Why, why can't it just be left as like, well, you know, why doesn't commanders yeah, think? Yeah, because I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna ask on top of I'd love to like pile onto that question now, as well. I don't think that's I don't think that's the solution the that we want is to say, oh well white's not commander's thing. Commander is our most popular sure like formal casual format. I mean the most popular format is cards I own and that's a fine format. But like for, you know for formats that have rules, commander is the most popular one. A lot of our players love white and they get frustrated and I hear from these people because I, I get on Twitter <laughs> And I ask them, hey, I'm the white collar pie rep. Tell me how you feel about, about white. And they have a lot of feelings. Um, and I want to make those feelings better. And, and, and to pile on to that question as well, is it okay if white is outside of standard a support color in modern and legacy and, and to an extent vintage and things like that? Or, or, or should we maybe think that one of the colors can be a color that is better when it's supporting other colors? Is that a thing that, I guess we're happy with, or is that something you'd like to move it away from? Or? Well, so I'm not really the right person to ask that kind of question because okay. I don't follow legacy and modern particularly right. okay. much. Okay. Um, but I, I will say it certainly is a challenge for us to print cards that are an appropriate level, power level for standard, which mm -hmm. is where we're printing the bulk of our cards, yeah. and have them be impactful in modern and legacy. Okay, okay, that's fair, that's fair. You mentioned uh, we were uh, uh, chatting last night, and I made a comment very casually uh, uh, where I said, well, it's not like when you're designing cards, uh, you obviously think about Commander, but you don't necessarily think about Legacy. And you you replied, that's not necessarily true. And is, is that something that uh, you can expand on is, is, is this idea that, you know, you do. Yeah. I mean, like we're all magic players in R and D, right? right? It's not like any I of us were just so. like, I'm a game designer and they hired me and taught me to play this game called magic. And then, and then it told me, well, you know, make cards for, for exactly standard and nothing else. You know, we all know what's out there and we, you know, we all know what people would like to have and what you know, what tools they they would appreciate having. Um, so, I you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a priority that in every set we're like, all right, we need at least five cards that are going to be big legacy hits in this standard set. But you know, I wouldn't say that we completely ignore it and and don't even think about it if the possibility exists. Okay. We're also entering a world where there's more cards bypassing standard than ever before, with like fifteen different commander products and. 
and True. Horizons and all this sort of Horizons things. did her, uh, Horizons did a lot for Popper. Yeah. We got a lot. We got some cards that needed to be banned in Popper from Horizons. Uh, that, that was every format, Brian. <laughs> 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 so we've talked about Alpha and how Alpha had some imbalances and those things definitely sharp in Commander especially. Do we think that perhaps some of the things that White used to do, some of its things like Balance and Armageddon, are just not where design space wants to be anymore, a post New World Order, whatever design change we've had. Yeah, so I, it's not really a New World, world Order thing. That's mm -hmm. more just about complexity on commons. But, right. but modern design sensibilities, we look at a card like Armageddon, and I guess the way I'd put it for myself is like, how likely is it that after I cast this spell, my opponent, who is playing magic for you know maybe their third or fourth time, quits the game forever? Right. And with Armageddon, I'd say that's very high compared <laughs> compared to most other cards. It is actually very high. I but mean, you didn't ask that question with Nexus of Fate? No. <laughs> I, well, to be honest, that's not the worst. As much as I don't know if that's a joke or not, like extra turn spells seem to upset players as much as mass land destruction does. Uh, I think magic so. players just get upset a lot. We like to moan a bit. Have you noticed that at Wizards of the Coast that magic <laughs> players tend to maybe moan a little bit? <laughs> Not really, no. no. But you, you make really. a point. I, I definitely appreciate that point. But at yeah. the same time, like, there is times and places for certain cards, right? Right, and so, like, the, the sort of griefer aspect of white, like, we, <laughs> which, like, I think this, that uh, is... This, me in the soul. No, but, but I think it's, it's still an important part of white color pie. First of all, flavorfully, right? That white is the color of law and order, so it's going to be like, no, you can't have your thing. And, like, that that is still... An important thing, and I. You sound like a blue player there, though, when you said that. Well, I, I, I can. I'm thinking about cards like Smothering Tithe and sure. Tithe Taker that are like, no, you must follow my rules that I set. And, and of course, Thalia. And yes, and Thalia. Like those cards, I think are sort of you know that's sort of a, a good viable direction for the future in a way that Armageddon is not. Okay, fair enough. Although we might see variant, oh, you can't really say, but we saw one variant in Dominaria. So mm -hmm. for the mass land destruction aficionados out yeah. there, we may see another variant right. at some if, point in the future. It, right. If Armageddon were reprinted in Ikoria, I would still be saying this. And <laughs> so maybe it is, actually. Uh, uh, are there things then that each color has that are the property of that color or at the very least something that other colors have incredibly difficult access to? Yes, absolutely. What would you say that is for white? Uh, there's a number of things. So first of all, cards like Banishing Light, like answer absolutely any permanent. White white can do that. No other color can do that. Glorious In a temporary fashion, though, or like a, 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 a way that can be gone back on, right? Yes, yeah. generally. Um, so well, there's there's a variety of ways of in which that can work. Okay. Um, so... I, uh, I can get into that right now. Like, there's sure. sort of four basic drawbacks for white removal because white is, in addition to loving justice, white loves mercy. White is sort of the, the kindest hearted mm -hmm. and does not actually want to kill you. They just want you to obey the rules and be a good member of society. Sure. So there's four kinds of drawbacks that white removal can have. One is targeting restrictions, right? Either attacking creature or tapped creature, or creature with power four or greater. Mm -hmm. One is... Uh, reversibility, things like O-Ring and Banishing Light, where conceivably, if they spend a card destroying it, then they can get their creature back. Sure. Um, one is Symmetry, where, okay, it's, I, I cast Shatter the Sky, all our creatures are gone, but... Armageddon. Um, yeah, Armageddon. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, cards like Wrath of God, um, sure. that the just kill everyone's creatures, well, that's fair, right? That's just, it's... Yeah. Uh, and then... Um, and the last is compensation, right? Cards like Swords to Plowshares or Path to Exile, where it's like, well, I took away your thing, but I'm sorry, so here, have this. Beast Within. Yeah, Be Fair, Beast Within, right. White card. <laughs> exactly, Beast Within is actually, you know, we, we just reprinted that yeah. as generous gift because it is a generous gift. Here, take this elephant, Vince. I'm sorry about your Emrakul. Yeah. Well, not Emrakul. That's a bad example, <laughs> but yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about your Gristlebrand. Have yeah. this elephant. Right. Cool, okay. So then shouldn't, I've got to ask, Shouldn't Oubliette be a white card? Because Oubliette feels very white. It locks up a creature, but they can maybe one day be reformed and escape or or otherwise get away. It isn't just killing them uh, uh, mercilessly. It's throwing them behind lock and key. Isn't a card like Oubliette a white card? Yes, it is. And I will tell you more than that. Oubliette is whiter than Oblivion Ring. And here's why. 
Because when you get out of the oubliette, you get back your auras mm -hmm. and right. any counters that were on you. Your belongings have been safely stored and returned to you. As it, it should feel, yeah, be. Yeah, it doesn't feel very black. When you get There's out of jail key, so in right. an orderly society, <laughs> you know, we want you to return and be a productive member of society. We're going, you know, it's not about punishment, it's about rehabilitation. So take your auras back, take your counters back, go forth and sin no more, right? Whereas black, do you really think a black jailer is going to be like, Oh yeah, here's your counters. We held on to them. We didn't take right. any of them for ourselves. Right. You know, that's, that's so so all, all I'm hearing here is that the reason Ubli hasn't been reprinted is because of color by break and that upsets some what it wizards. Well, it is a, I mean, that, that's a, I mean, a fair yeah. statement to yeah. say is that, the, I mean, and that happens yeah. with old cards a lot that you find those, you know, they were still getting their legs and st such, but Oubliette is essentially breaking the color pie, isn't it? Well, the, they, well they moved, didn't they? they I wasn't moved. asking you, I was oh, asking sorry. you. sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I, I'll, that, I'll pretend I'm not here. Yes. Yes, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> He's, I feel so sorry for Ari having to put up with us. Right. Like, uh... Yeah, I would say Oubliette is a color pi color pie break. I'm not sure that's the deciding factor in how often we reprint it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Was All right. it the first color pie break? Because I was thinking about how Beast Within was a color pie break before White got that as a spell, right? Because Generous Gift is a very recent thing in Modern Horizons where they shifted yes. that into White. But I guess Oubliette was like the original Oblivion Ring, way before Oblivion Ring was a thing. We're talking like. Five, ten years. Oubliette only hits uh, creatures. Uh, Oblivion Ring is creatures. Oh, so, or so there's a strict, uh, strict upside. Okay. Sure. I'm just, it's just interesting that it might be one of the earliest uh, shifts of mechanics, I guess. But I mean, we'd have to. I mean, there, there's look. lots of them. Like if you look back in Alpha, right, there's regeneration in red and, and toughness pumping in red. And like there's. Um, like th there's all kinds of bizarre stuff that it's like, wh why would you put that in that color? Right. Um, that yeah, it's almost like we shouldn't use Alpha to balance our colors in the modern day. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is the case. And the, the color pie does continuously evolve. And that's sure. another thing that the Council of Colors does is that we make decisions based on real world data, right? It's not like we have these stone tablets and we say, right, this is what the color pie is. If we find like based on tournament data, based on player feedback, oh, this just isn't working, then we make changes. So recently I launched a campaign and moaned a lot about Stoneforge Mystic being uh, not legal in modern and they mm -hmm. had banned it uh, and ended up being not very good. But as the white representative on the, on the Council of Colors, were you in any meetings or privy to any information? Or were you involved in that decision in any way? Uh, no, I was not. Um, so first of all, I, I only became the white representative recently since oh, it was unbanned. Oh, okay. But I doubt that my predecessor was either because what we do, as I said, is not power level. Yeah, so right? you look through the, 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 the card files to check that it's adhering to the, yeah. the non-tableted commandments and stuff. Yeah, and you know, if we find something that's that's like too much of a bend or if we think it's a break, then we'll, we'll you know, we, we are an advisory council, so we'll give feedback to the, the team that's designing this set and be like, here's why we don't like this. But it's not like we can veto cards or anything like that. Right, okay, that's fair, that's fair. So speaking of green taking things from white, recently green took merfolk from white. We saw in Ixalan green merfolk, and I want to know, because I'm very interested in the white merfolk of Lorwyn, what traits and characteristics do you think are inherently white about merfolk, everyone's most popular tribe? The, that's really not a question that I was prepared to answer, but thank you so much for bringing it up. Oh my goodness, you've, you've exiled Brian. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> that's me being like, well, I mean, worse things have happened at sea, I yeah, guess. Worse things have happened. <laughs> Brian? Ah, Pleasant Kenobi, I was just stretching my calves on the bookshelf. Isometric exercise. Care to join me? Why is there smoke coming out of that box of magic cards, Brian? Oh, oh, that isn't smoke, it's steam. Steam adding atmosphere to the piping hot games of Commander we're about to have. <laughs> piping hot Commander night. 